And thank all of you for allowing me to be here tonight. I'm so privileged and honored. And uh, when I was 16 years of age, I had a dream to come to Los Angeles and pastor a church. I was the least likely person to have that dream. I came from Phoenix, Arizona, and I uh, grew up in a middle-class community. But at 16 years of age, God spoke to my heart that someday I'd be in Los Angeles pastoring a church. I never knew when it would take place. I thought maybe when I was 50 or 60 or 70, you know, God would open up the door. But at 16 years of age, God called me. And at 20 years of age, he opened the door for me to come into the inner city of L.A. and pastor a church. I'll never forget when I first got to the church, there were about 15 to 20 members of my congregation. And all of them were over 65 years of age. So in one week, they're going from a pastor who was 82 years of age to a pastor that was 20 years of age, all taking place in one week. So you imagine the challenges that I had the first week I got there. The first thing I did is I came from a big church of 14,000 members in Phoenix, so I was used to kind of, you know, making changes quite often. Because my dad's kind of a cutting-edge guy. He's 65 years of age, and he likes classical music. He likes rap music. I mean, he likes everything, you know. Anything that has a good message to it, he likes. And so I'm kind of used to going with the flow and always evolving and changing. So I decided that I'd take the, uh, the, the piano and move it from one side of the stage to the other my first week. That was a big mistake. I lost half of my 15 members the first week because I moved the organ from one side of the stage to the other. And man, it was tough. I lost half my church. I was so discouraged. And I tried everything. And finally, a lady in the church came up to me and she said, Pastor, let me tell you what you've got to do. If you want to build this church, there's people all over this city that used to come to this church. If you do all the traditional religious programs that we have done for years, all the lost sheep will somehow come back to the church in the inner city. So I was willing to try anything at that point, you know, after the great church reduction in the first six months. You know, I can write the book on how to grow a church, from, uh, to reduce a church from 15 down to 7. And uh, so I decided I'd listen to him and I try to do everything. I try to put the plants in the same place that they used to be, and I moved the organ on one, the back to the stage where it belonged, and I tried everything I could to try to get people into my world. I tried everything to set my world so beautiful, thinking people would come in. I did all the traditional Sunday school programs I grew up in, but people were not coming into my world. And one night I looked out after trying to build a traditional church in the inner city, and there were only two people that showed up in my church. I was so discouraged, I went home as a 20-year-old preacher, and I wept in my pillow at night, and I said, oh, God, I'm a failure. Maybe you, your anointing was on my father, but maybe it's not on me. And I went home, and I wept, and I sobbed, and I said, oh, God, give me a word that will encourage me. And God spoke to my heart, a word that really wasn't encouraging. He said, I want you to get up right now, and I want you to go to Echo Park in downtown L.A., so God, for God to tell you to go to Echo Park in the middle of the night, it's a pretty bold word, you know. So I decided I had nothing to lose. I was already dead anyways. I'd go down there and give it a shot. And so I went down to Echo Park, and I walked around the street. And that night as I walked down the street, I looked, and I saw helicopters flying over the sky looking for criminals. And I looked over the street, and I saw a bunch of gang members up against police cars and getting beaten down. And looked down the street, I saw a homeless man that was stumbling out of a bar in the middle of the night drunk and as he passed out in an alley I walked through the streets and it was like God was giving me an illustrated sermon that night on what he wanted me to do and he said the problem is that night he spoke to my heart he said you've expected people to come into your world he said quit expecting people to come into your world and start putting yourself in another man's world from that day on, God changed me. I went back to my church, and I said to my secretary, I'm doing everything different. I said, we need to move my office outside of the church. She said, what? I said, outside. So every day I'd be out there studying, and as I was studying, all the mamas would bring their little boys to school. And on the way to school, I learned to speak Spanish just by talking to everybody in my neighborhood. I didn't know anyone, and I, I was the only white kid within five miles of any direction, you know, in my community. And so I just decided that I would just get to know people and forget about the world I came from and ever looking back of going back to Phoenix I went home and I ripped up all my postcards that remind me of home and I started to suffer for Jesus I started to go to all the different restaurants in the city just to get to know people you know I went to the Korean barbecue restaurants oh glory to God I'm getting hungry let's just go home and forget the service right now you know and all the Mexican restaurants you know and just suffering for Jesus and all of a sudden I decided in my mind 
that my world would no longer be my world. I was going to put myself in another man's world. And I wasn't going to leave that city until God built the kind of church that he wanted to build. The church began to grow and things began to take off. And we began to adopt all the streets in our neighborhood. Two people would take a block and serve the people in the community. And now we have 700 people every Saturday that go out every single week and adopt all the streets, making 32,000 home visits every Saturday. Not preaching to people, but just knocking on doors and picking up trash and painting out graffiti and bringing food to those that are hurting and just serving the people in our community. There's all those times where it felt like the dream was dying. You see, there's some times in your life where you try to hold on to a dream. And after a while, you hold on to it for a while, but then there comes a transition where if you entrench yourself into community, you don't have to hold on to the dream anymore, but the dream gets a hold of you, and it won't let you go. Things begin to happen. We start opening up our little old building at the time that we had for, for the community. Every single day would open up, and families would come, and would give food bags away, and Every square inch of our building was used to serve people in our community. We bought 16 houses in the neighborhood, and we put people from drug and alcohol and rehabilitation programs in there, and we start giving them discipleship and mentoring and ministering to people in the community. And God began to do an awesome work, and we began to see gang members getting saved, and we bought houses and start rehabilitating them, and we knew that the Lord was doing something special. When one day I was driving off the Hollywood Freeway, and I saw a big old hospital, the old Queen of Angels Hospital, right off the 101 and, and Rampart area, and I saw the hospital and went in there and talked to the uh, Catholic church and owned it, um, some Franciscan nuns that, that were in charge of it, and we sat down and talked to them about a price, and the building was about $16 million at one time, and we told them we didn't have that much money, but we told them our dream that God gave us. And to our surprise, they said, you know what? This building was $16 million, but we like your vision. We'll sell you that building, 400,000 square feet, 1,738 rooms. They said, we'll sell it to you for $3.9 million. You have 18 months to raise the money. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is there's no way in the world we have $3.9 million to raise. We went back to our church, and back then we only had about a few hundred members, and most of them were all homeless, you know, from the streets, and uh, I had a church vote. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. A lot of these guys didn't have a penny in their pocket. I said, we have a $3.9 million dream to buy this building. How many of you are interested in buying the building? You know, these guys had nothing to lose. Right. Amen, brother, you got my vote. I had a 300 to nothing vote, man. These guys had, how many here know sometimes it's good to have guys with nothing to lose on your team? They won't steal the vision, the dream God gives you. So we started raising the money, preaching all over America. When finally, I, I, we started, tried everything. We didn't have the money after about nine, nine months. We thought that maybe that the dream God gave us was dead. And that maybe we just stepped out in crazy faith. And maybe this is not what God had for our life. We didn't have the money, but we started reaching the hurting and reaching the poor and ministering to runaways and prostitutes that we bring into our place and rescue them off the street away from their pimps and take them into our place and rehabilitate these runaway, throwaway kids on the streets. And doing all the 200 different ministries and the 7,000 kids that come to Sidewalk Sunday School every single week that we have children's church in the middle of housing projects with guns and flying over, people, planes flying over and gang members on every street corner. All we kept on doing is reaching out, but we still, we can only pay the interest. We need $3.9 million. But one day I get a phone call from a man, and he's, he's the most negative man. He, in fact, he was the guy who told us, if you come to L.A., I will never support you guys again. He told my dad that in Phoenix, in the church I came from, because he didn't believe it was God's will for us to come to L.A. And so he called and said, I'm in town for business. Can I talk with you? And the first thing that came to my mind is, I don't want to show this guy around. This negative old man's going to discourage my vision. But finally, he said, well, I'm just around the corner. I want to come. And as a preacher, I tried everything I could to get out of it. You know, every excuse, but I couldn't. So he decided to come, and I showed him around the building. And all of a sudden, this man's heart was breaking. He said, you know what, Pastor, my dream for L.A. is I thought the only way to reach L.A. was to drop a bomb on the city and start all over again because I feel that L.A. was the problems for all the problems in America start from this city. He said, but when I walk around this place and I see the teenagers in rehabilitation, I see the 500-plus residents that are living there every single day coming off drugs and alcohol and the volunteers from all over the world that give a year of their life. He said, I believe that God can save this city. He said, Pastor, will you forgive me? And when he said, will you forgive me, this businessman, he pulled out his checkbook. He said, Pastor, will you forgive me? He wrote out a check for $1 million, and he gave me that check. 
And I said, you are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son. I'm looking for holy water, anything, you know, to throw on this guy. And he said, I got a son. He's got as much money as I do. Do you mind if he comes? I said, I'll pay his ticket. How about right now? Bring that guy over here. And his son gave us a million dollars. And then a man from Malaysia came over who heard about our dream. And he was a billionaire. And he said, I'm in town buying all the Laura Ashley stores in America. I said, oh, sounds like you really don't have anything going on. But uh, he said, I want to give you guys $500,000. And in a matter of 30 days, $2.5 million came in. And I begin to realize something. When you start reaching out to the poor and the hurting and the afflicted, and you give your life towards those they have nothing to give you in return, God from heaven sees any vision on any kind of level, and God will meet the need of any work that's ministering and caring for the poor. The Bible says he who lends to the poor, he who gives to the poor lends to God, and he will repay what he has given. And I tell you, God will invest in any vision that's reaching the poor. You see, there's a time in my life where I used to dream of having a big church, and God's given us several thousand members, but I don't think about that anymore. All I think about is the individual out there every time I preach, the stories that come. There's a time where I, all I cared about was success, and I don't, I've died to that dream a long time ago, but lived to the dream of getting up every morning and serving this generation the best you can. The first day I came to L.A., I closed with this story. There's a young man that was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting, and his body laid on the steps of our church. This is my first day to L.A. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I came into my church, and there were only about 10 to 12 members at that time. And I sat down, and I talked with them, introduced myself as a new pastor. But God checked my spirit. He said, no. I want you to stand up to these people and challenge them to go across the street to that family that lives in that apartment attached to the liquor store, and I want you to minister to that family. I, I asked them if they'd come with me next door, and all of them said they don't feel like God had led them to go and visit. And I said, well, come on, let's just go anyways. And finally, they wouldn't come, so I took up an offering. As most preachers do, you get turned down for volunteers, so you receive an offering, you know. And uh, they gave me $38. I put it in my pocket, went across the street. Knocked on the door of the little apartment attached to the liquor store, and the door opened. I couldn't believe it. The door flung open. I was staring in the face of the biggest gang member I'd ever seen in my life. He looked down at me, and I looked up at him, and then I looked up at God and said, God, I've always heard there's a place called heaven. Save me a place because I'm coming home real soon, you know. He said, what do you want? I said, I've come to pray for the family and give them all money. And he stared at me, and after a while, I, he let me in. I walked in, and I gave her the money, and I was out the door. I'm not like David Wilkerson. I'm not going to get in there, and I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm giving her the money, and I'm out the door, you know. And as I'm heading for the door, an arm, grab, a hand grabbed me on the shoulder and spun me around. And again, I'm staring in the face of the biggest gang member I've ever seen in my life. Now, you've got to understand, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, the most middle-class community, golf club, country club in America. The only gang members I'd ever seen in my life were those little well, white kids that walk around in the mall that their mom drops them off in a Mercedes outside the food court, you know, by your local mall, and they walk around with the saggy pants on, you know, and their hat, hat on backwards, and then the mom picks them up outside the food court in about an hour, the gangsters for a day. I mean, that's the kind I'm used to seeing. But, man, this is a real Slim Shady. I mean, this is a real guy, you know, and... Uh, and I'm walking around, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And I got out of there, and all of a sudden, as I'm walking out, the hand grabs me, spun me around. He says, Padre, I want you to do something for me. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm not a Padre, but if he calls me a Padre, he's, I'm the Padre. You know, I'm not going to argue with him. I said, yes, my son, what would you like? He said, Padre, I want you to do something for me. I said, brother, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll rub your feet. I'll rub your back. I'll order you beer. I might even drink it with you. Just don't kill me, you know. He said, I want you to stay, and I want you to pray. I got to the center of the circle, and I joined hands with all these gang members, and I began to pray, a wimpy prayer. You know, one of those star book for minister prayers that you memorize? Lord, bless this habitation with your glorification and your manifestation. Flood this place with every Asian I can think about. You know, I was praying. And halfway through my prayer, God spoke to my heart. He said, you're praying like a wimp. Pray like you really mean it. And I said, God, I pray that because of what happened today, that young kids can walk down the street and not worry about getting hit by a bullet. I pray that these kids will realize that only you control life and death, and you are the controller of all things, God. I pray these kids will repent, and they'll get their life right with God, and they won't live this way anymore. 
And all of a sudden, to my prayer, my hand was getting squeezed next to me tighter, and I said, God, I'm going down. But if I pray hard enough, I might get my name into the Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I, oh, God, you repent. And I started, I started naming sins that they were doing that God didn't even know that they were doing, you know? And at the very end, all of a sudden, I felt my hand getting squeezed next to me tighter. I said, God, I'm going down. I thought I was going down. And all of a sudden, my hand was being raised in the air to the right. My hand was being raised in the left. And every single one of these big, tough gang members on my first day in L.A., I stood in the middle, and I, I led them in the sinner's prayer. And every single one of those men accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior on that day. And I had the best bodyguards in the city of L.A. My car never got broken into from that day. What I'm trying to say to you today is this. If you want to be happy, if you live your life with palms up, you're only going to be happy at Christmas time and your, and your birthday. But there's a way you can be happy 365 days a year, living your life for others. You'll never be the same again. What I'm telling you is to die to your dream of success. And you live to your dream of being significant in the lives of people. God will do more in your life ever seeking success. You just lose yourself in the needs of others, and God will build what he wants to build. God bless.